Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Color Authority podcast. We are staying in Africa. As you know, the first podcast of 2024 was with Laura in Zimbabwe. And today I'm going to be talking to Ralia Ezravi, who is going to podcast with us out of Cairo. Now, Ralia is a design professional and researcher. She's an associate professor of practice and design at the graphic design program at the American University in Cairo. She's co-founder of Fountain Collective, an art and design research practice based between Cairo and Amsterdam. She's co-founder of the artistic director of Cairo Tronica, Electronic and New Media Arts Festival in Cairo. She was also finalist for the Dutch Prix de Rome Prize in 2015 and the Dutch Design Awards in 16. She was awarded the Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship in 2016 for research at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. She has lectured and exhibited widely in Europe, the U.S., and the Middle East, including in the Centre Pompidou, the Rotterdam International Film Festival, ISPC in New York, London Art Fair, and Porto Design Biennale, and of course, Amman Design Week. Let's hear Ralia and see what her perspective is and all these stereotypes that she wishes to break in the region. Good afternoon, Ralia, and welcome to the Color Authority podcast. How are you today? Hello, you did. All is good. I'm so excited to be part of this podcast. It, uh, of course, we talked a lot about it, and uh, I'm curious about how uh, this conversation, where it will take us. Like normally when I have these podcasts, like I prepare um, and then the whole, the conversation just takes a whole new journey. So I'm ex excited as well. Yes. And uh, welcome to Cairo. My office is in the middle of the Malik. So noisy, light, bright. Good, uh, good, good that you have this opportunity to visit each other, even virtually, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a blessing. We met last year when I when I spoke at the university where you are also a professor at the American University of Cairo, and I was never I've never been in Cairo, and I remember in the evening we met, and I was so surprised by the sounds, the smells, the absence of colors. But then you told me that indeed when you go out, because I went to the pyramids the day after, and and you told me, but on the highway, look at the buildings that obviously are being constructed or taken down or they're being rebuilt. And then you see a lot of color. And that was such good advice because Cairo per se is not very colorful until you get on the highway. And then you see people's inner homes are super colorful, but really very colorful, much more than here in Europe, to be honest. Yes, true. I think also the environment around Cairo, like, you know, the building environment, climate, it's, it's, a, it's a desert. So colors are, and it's very bright and the sun is very strong. So to maintain colors, bright colors is a, is a problem always. So there are colors, but they are faded. And usually you find colors uh, when you observe people, you know, like how they dress up, as you said, inside of their houses. You know, in little details, but not in the built environment. Color is uh, much, much less. So you see stones and cement, <laughs> bridges. Um, but also if you go outside this big cities, you, uh, you find nature and, you know, water and, you know, beautiful landscapes. So color is, is there, but you need to look for it. Yeah, that's something that really surprised me. But I think it was good when, when you told me about the highways because I took pictures and uh, finally I got my my color input. So I normally start this conversation with the same question. Um, it's been five seasons and I'm really looking forward to your answer. And that is, what is color to you, Ralia? Well, I'm a designer. <laughs> so color is, uh, is a very important, uh, how to say, element uh, and, uh, in my work. And uh, I can also describe uh, my journey with color because I come from a Middle Eastern background. I grew up in Damascus, Syria, and I moved to the Netherlands. So also my perception of color and music color changed through my life. Um, but, you know, color is, uh, is association. Uh, I like stories about color. I'm very interested in untold stories about color. 
but certainly I'm, I'm uh, someone who, who like bright colors, some colors. You can see it also in my work, uh, design work. Uh, I think also colors have to do with bravery, you know, choosing like a, a brave combination of color. It's very daring. So I, I like to change, uh, to challenge myself in that uh, aspect as a designer. You have, um, so people just obviously heard your bio. You have so many professional hats that when I was preparing my talking points, I was like, where do I start to make questions for this this power woman. You are a design advocate. So when I look at your bio and what I see that your your projects that you've been doing over the last couple of years is that it seems that you're a design advocate for the underrepresented in this world. And obviously, we all, no matter where we live, we live in a very Western point of view world, especially also still in, in design. Can you explain the audience what it is that you do for this underrepresented world? What I mean with under, underrepresented, me, for me, it's a kind of um, underrepresented narratives. So we, we have like, we need to acknowledge that there is a domination of uh, specific narratives around specific cultures, communities, part of histories. So I think from my position as someone coming from the Middle East and lived in Europe for a long time, I was interested in trying to design a counter narratives, or um, I'm interested in shedding light on those unrepresented narratives. Also, to, as an attempt to not to change uh, perspectives on them, but also to uh, broaden the perspective. And, and, you know, like there are different ways and there are different positions to each story. So, I'm always interested in challenging myself to find those positions and uh, uh, represent them. And also, I, I, I managed to surround myself with people who are believing the same uh, way. Uh, so, for example, found that collective, me and Lauren Alexander, mm -hmm. she's a designer and artist as well. She's from South Africa. So, so when we met, we both shared this kind of vision or a uh, a position that we need to talk about that because we know more. And it's, it's kind of also it's a shared responsibility as well towards our communities and our audience to, to work with these topics. So this is what we're trying to do, uh, curating our own stories, not only designing the song uh, C, uh, things that usually hidden, and uh, we have the ability to communicate them. So we started this kind of, journey of involving more research, uh, more writing, investigative work, we call it sometimes, to find new stories and new, new kind of interesting projects that will change the discourse around the topics that we're talking about, but also change the position of design in general. Where does this passion come from? Did it come from you moving around a lot? Did it come for you being a designer is it something that even when you were a little girl you were already very passionate about you know connecting life society economics politics to 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 design of course living in different places and experiencing uh, yourself in different kind of environments changes the way how you see things so for sure my interest in politics changed when i moved to the netherlands i, I grew up in the middle east where of course, we, we have a lot of censorship around specific issues. In the Netherlands, there is more space uh, to talk about things, so and more also room to question things, for example. But also, you face a lot of stereotype, stereotyping around specific topics. So you, you think like, oh, um, maybe I can change something there. But also... As as a Middle Eastern woman, storytelling is a is a natural thing. You now we like to talk, we like to communicate, uh, we like to bring personal experiences in our work, emotions, uh, many things. So it's a combination of of both. And I think nowadays, if I talk about how design practice changed through maybe in the last ten years or fifteen years, I see like amazing possibility. And I keep telling my students, you know, you can work anywhere. You are educated to tell stories, 
find also our or uh, identify important stories and communicate that. So that could be in, in, uh, if you're working with specific brands uh, or commercial kind of sphere, or even if you're working with an NGO, or even if you if you would change your field, you know, if you are a chef or you've decided to be a writer or even a teacher. So I think design um, is a tool to be a better communicator, whatever you choose to to take your future career to. So. So when you talk about stereotypes, I mean, I can think of the stereotypes, obviously, that people confront you with. But what are the typical stereotypes that you come across? And, or, and do you see a change over the last couple of years since you are working on also breaking those stereotypes? I think I can say that the, the most, you know, like, I don't want to talk about like, so much politics but even if i'm talking about design and design landscape it was very kind of europe centered mm -hmm. western centered like what design is and what design mean and uh, also as a practice but i think it's it's not true you know like you can find design in our culture as well you know like also in ancient time if you visit Luxor, for example, or even the pyramids, you see the, those beautiful walls, you know, like the, with the hieroglyphs. For me, this is information for design. This is a very sophisticated way to summarize an experience or a, a lifetime uh, using pictograms, very efficient in using color and symbolism, for example. So the, it's the way how you approach it the way how you look at it even using design elements like grid and typography it exists also in our culture but it wasn't presented as such it wasn't presented as part of the global design there was no uh, platform yes exactly and i think this is why i like my job now because we we try so much in design education here in the region to change that to bring new resources, new references that will enable future designers to be uh, more, you know, like it that uh, speaks about them and about their culture more than adapting to new or important design understanding or new understanding of design. So we are trying to embrace that with keeping of course, like the resources that we, we all share, like, you know, but we need to have a voice in that. And this is what we're trying to do here. So I'm, I start to involve more about, about writing about design and vision, about the meaning in, of design in our community and how we can use design to improve our life, our culture, our choices. This is a, a bit what I am at the moment. What role do you think that design plays in, in, in still also the current happenings in the world, no matter where you are in the world, but also how this reflects on color? Like, how do you think that bringing, what, you know, working with and supporting the, what, what we call the underrepresented in, in the world in design, what role can color play in this, do you think? Because yeah, even just yesterday, I was at Arco, so it's the Madrid Art Fair, and there was this exhibition about the Portuguese resistance. Uh, obviously, many years ago, everything was red. Well, now, obviously, red has a very significant protest color in, in Europe. It has a completely different meaning when we look at politics, especially in the United States currently. And again, it's very different in the United Kingdom. So it's it, there is color when we talk about art, when we talk about design. What is your point of view and what you do and with the people you work with and how color is represented in that way? Yeah, for sure, color is part of uh, the, say, like the resistance. Sometimes it's also surprising what color can bring or what kind of messages color can bring. I can give you like a really simple example. Like ten, more than 10 years ago when the Syrian uprising started, people were, of course, dealing with a lot of censorship in public space, but they failed to communicate the amount of violence and also the amount of grief that they were facing daily. So suddenly, most of the people started 
put this Syrian flag. Of course, flags, uh, and they really like uh, immediately sh show identification with specific national, you know, meanings. Yeah. But what was surprising is, um, so the Syrian flag is, is a red, black, uh, white in the middle and uh, two stars. But then they start changing the equation of each color according to what's happening. So if, if there is more violence in the street, the red become more than the black or the green. And when the, the more grief or there's a lot of people die, to see the black is taking over. So we, I, I kind of like collected those flags through a period of time. And suddenly you see the color go in a very beautiful animation showing and reflecting what was happening at that time without any words, you know, but every Syrian person at that moment was knowing what what this wave of of color change meaning or means at that time so people found a way to communicate what they feel what they where they stand politically changing the, the equation of the flag colors and i find it a very beautiful example also because you know the meaning of each color and the flag and you know also drawing references to history. So it's, it says more than just a color. What are the meanings of the colors of the Syrian flag? I don't think a lot of people know that. Red is uh, linked to the uh, martyry blood. So it's, it's referred to a period in history. We fought for against uh, colonialism. Black has to do with the uh, seat, uh, like the Basi period. And then suddenly... A group of people or activists started to use another flag where the equation also were different. And you see until now, a lot of people fuss at, at this moment in time because we are still divided. So I find it really beautiful. this kind of that colors to moment in history that we need to know about, refer to also the, the significance of this color in specific culture. Yeah, I find I find it very interesting. And then I become more interested about yeah. stories of color and, and they, they relate to colonialism. And I try to bring this into my classes, my students understand that. But for example, we I give an assignment where they need to investigate a uh, history of color in relation to where they live. And many interesting stories came out. And then you can't look to colors the same way. And no. So, for example, yellow. I don't know if you are aware of the shade of yellow, yellow mummy yellow. No, I don't. British tourists. Uh, I think it's in the time where Egypt was under the British mandate. And many British groups, tourists, different, like they would come and visit the pyramids and the pharaoh and uh, culture. And they, they would smuggle mummies to Europe. So they like to collect them, smuggle them, and they would uh, organize a party to unpack the mummy. Yeah, th this is not allowed anymore, of course, a long time ago. Course. But it was very fascinating that finished. What was happening with the remains of the mummy, this, this powder, you know, like the, the body remains. And one of the, like, uh, applied or purposes, they will use it as pigment to create a shade of color that called the uh, mummy yellow. So that was very interesting. It was very interesting also for my students to, to know about that, you know? Yeah, we try to shed light on those stories. Uh, of course, the indigo blue and its relation to uh, colonizing the world. Uh, also, how this indigo affected uh, other industries, you know, like the... the and also agriculture, like the cotton, because the cotton is easier to dye than wool. So it was. It's, it's also linked to all these kind of important moments in history that shaped the world and also part of where we find ourselves now. So for me, color is always a lead to these stories. And uh, I love to uh, investigate them. I think color stories, uh, a lot of people often know where pigments come from. Like indigo, the, you know, the name in Greek already says it. It comes from India, which obviously came to the rest of the world. Indeed, as you said, through colonization, traveling, depending what where you are born in the world, how you call it, obviously, how color has traveled throughout the world and what the history of that is. And I think that makes, I think, color so interesting. It 
always has a story, whether it's the old story or the new story that you built on it in a product, in a service, or part also of what you do, obviously, with your graphic work, you know, creating narratives through graphic work. How do you see that designers of, of, of today are using their resistance, their protest to whatever is happening in the world? How are they using this in, in their design form? I know you work a lot with graphics, cartoons. And what, what do you see as, let's say, the, the latest trends in this area? I think uh, if I can uh, talk about the current moment, I think designers in the region here trying to use design to navigate through uh, different challenges. Censorship, for example. You know, like, for example, with what's happening now in Palestine, suddenly the, the watermelon become a symbol of the Palestinian resistance because it's, uh, it has the same color as the Palestinian flag. Because it was forbidden to, to wear the flag or to, to hold the flag. So it, we, we always find intelligent way. And this is what I, I tell my students. We as designer have maybe a different role and a different position than an activist or in a, a writer or so we need to also use this uh, as a way to how to say trick power or be uh, out out uh, outnumber all these kind of like strategies to silence us i think we are we are succeeding in that and i think this is the intelligence of design because you could use simple things to make your message come across and a very powerful message without using so much words. And this is, I think, what's what interests me. Like It's become more difficult and difficult to navigate public space, for example. So how can we use other spheres like social media? And now social media also become kind of, uh, you know, another <laughs> censored public space. So I think designers have the ability to speculate, reimagine new possibilities, new narratives, kind of be visionary, you know, to, to the existing, uh, existing market, even leaders. So I'm very optimistic about the role of design. And I think we are on track. It's going slowly, but we are on the right way. I think change when, I think, well, besides the first thing, in my opinion, is change comes from the people always. It never yes. comes from governments. It never comes from companies and organizations. It comes from the people. And I think this is a very clear moment, again, because history repeats in positive and negative ways. I think, again, it's a very much a people movement. And I think also color, not just graphic and cartoons, obviously, have a way to, to play with color. Like yesterday, I was here in Madrid, in Spain, and I bought a new pair of sneakers. And the moment the guy said, these colors of the sneaker produced in, in Spain are inspired by the watermelon. I just like, okay, they're mine. Like I'm having them. Because just through color, whether people are going to understand it, yes or not, when you wear them or when they see the combination of colors, it is your way to use color to make a statement or to 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 bring awareness, just like, like, like what you are doing. And I think also what the, the current movement is, is doing is to bring awareness to a what I hope is is an awakening. Yes, this is this is the only thing we can do. But also we have a very important role in uh, like I'll give you an example. And um, I gave a workshop when uh, this current event started to design something uh, in solidarity with Palestine, and many young students uh, asked me about like the importance of what you're doing. You know, like, hmm. um, it's not going to change anything. Uh, we feel powerless, uh, hopeless. So what can a poster do? You know, we are not going to change the world. And my answer to them was, it's a very good question, of course. My answer to them was, maybe what you're doing now is not going to change something now, but it will have a significant in the future. And I presented a very small presentation about the relation between design and the Palestinian resistance, 50s, and how 
many designers at that time joined uh, this course, even commissioned or voluntarily. And their role was so important to, to accumulate and to strengthen the, the, the visual identity of the resistance, to repeat and uh, design new symbols or maybe reuse old symbols and put them in a new context. So the resistance had become like known, the, the visual become aligned with their goals and their strategies. And look at, at them uh, now, if we, if we look about the history of uh, Palestinian resistance and we look at the collection and archives of posters, pamphlets, uh, even uh, movies, uh, this, is, this is what's remained. So it's, it's very important 30 years later, 50 years later, 70 years later, to, can, to come back to this archive and see what was happening at that moment in time. Of course, you could read names of people. It's a good documentation. You can uh, find people who are involved. You can find important events that at that moment were important to celebrate or statements about. Also, you can see it line trend that was linked to resistance so we can use it now and connect ourselves to a generation of uh, pioneer designers that they were working at that time so uh, we we need to stop looking at this, the the impact of what we are doing today and start looking at it from a broader maybe 50 years or 100 years yeah. what's what we're doing now will mean in the future. So for me, that's very important. And for them, it resonated because they could see it, you know, how they know about what happened 50 years ago, documenting, uh, curating exhibitions, designing symbols that we still use and see today. So for sure, we have a very important role. No, I think, and I think that is something that a lot of people are not aware of, how important this is going to bring along change over the next decades, not perhaps not not now indeed. I find it also interesting your work with the Fountainland Collective that you said that you have with your South African partner, where you work indeed with artists and designers, of course, that work in the West, but but what they need to reflect on. Um, so perhaps these are people that were not born in Europe, not born in in let's say what what we call the the West today, let's say the global North but that were born in the global South. What do we need, need to think about when they want to make art and design that is, let's say, sellable to, to, to the West? Like, And this is, I think, this is exactly the, the key of what we're living today. How can we make something inclusive? How can we make design understandable for a broader audience? Uh, this is very uh, a ch challenging question, but I think designers need to be they design they need to be more aware of what's really happening globally. They need to be active in like they need to be an active citizens as well. It's so not just uh, isolating themselves uh, from what's what's happening around them, but also they need to be clear about what they want to communicate, what kind of story exactly. So I see each product they design, if it's a small poster or if it's a piece of furniture or, you know, packaging for a product, they need to delve into the target audience that they're designing for and what's, what is the expectation of this product. And I think they need also to resist some, how to say, rules that the market really implies sometimes on us. Because of the market idea about selling and making quick profits, it's very difficult for some designer to navigate in that, especially young one, because in a way you need to work, you need to make a living. So this is why I believe we need to organize ourselves. We need to be involved in, in education more. I think uh, we need to uh, help the market that it's not ready. Sometimes I feel that the market sometimes is not ready for these new challenges to collaborate together and to think about what kind of future we want, what kind of new products we want, what kind of, uh, like, it's time to think about sustainability. It's time to think about less 
you know, consumerism. It's time to make about, to, to think about, yes, maybe in the future we will uh, buy less and uh, have more uh, sustainable uh, life. Um, we need to also be, consider health issues, uh, you know, like we can't keep going the way we live at the moment. And I think we try, this is why I'm involved in education. We, we try to educate young designers and kind of equip them with tools to convince communities that this change is necessary yeah. for their own benefits. We are not anymore a tool to make things look flashier or more beautiful for the you know, purpose of selling. We we need to be. This is why it's it's important also to like to to engage more in conversations, not to isolate ourselves. I think the change is happening. Uh, I think also if you think about consumers, they're really aware and they're really going beyond old strategies of design and, and advertising. Like and, and now you see like this boycott movement happening all over the world. It's really happening because it's. Consumers or people are aware of the ramification of their participation in this kind of cycle. And it doesn't matter how much they like a product, but they're aware of the, how to say, the story of this product and its connection to also things happening in the world. So I think it's, I'm hopeful that this will bring, it's starting to change, but we need to keep pushing. How yeah. I say, like, we need to resist. I think that's why your work with students is so important, especially in, in, in your region, of course, to, to work with students and make them understand, first of all, not just their point of view, whether they are from Cairo, whether they are from Egypt, whether they are Middle Eastern. Many Americans that obviously also come and study in, in Cairo, just generally, we are one people, we are one world, and there's only one. So yeah. <laughs> this is the moment. Yeah. Yeah, it is the moment. And I think by engaging ourselves uh, even and also collaborating with entities that we think they don't share our own belief, it's going to bring change because we are claiming our position, we are asking the right questions, we are pushing them to change as well. But when you when we leave the or when we decide not to participate, we lose on a lot of that. So uh, it's, it's about working harder to engage. So I encourage students to work in advertising agencies to also discover for themselves how they can make it better, you know, how they can, because they, they will be in, in direct conversation with clients. They will be in direct conversation with established professionals. Um, and they are very smart and very aware and they are the future. So they need to find their place. And they need to resist as well, smartly. That's true. I think when you then come in, because obviously they come in touch with corporates, corporates that have done things for decades the way that they have done them. And not just that, I think as a student, it is very easy sometimes to have this beautiful vision of who you are, what you want to be as a designer. And then you meet the real world. And then there is normally a big gap. There's a big gap to what is the consumer market, to what your, obviously the company that you're working with or for your client, what what they want. And that very often clashes with what you were brought up with, with your education um, and with, with many ideals that are sometimes very difficult to maintain. And I think this younger generation, however, is keeping more, they're holding on to their values a lot more than, than previous generations, and they're not letting go. And I think I think that is uh, a beautiful movement that we that we are seeing because they are obviously part of the of the workforce already, and that's only going to be increasing. Yes, I totally agree. And I think also they they are different than us. Uh, they they I think they grew up also in uh, they're brave for sure. They grew up also. For example, I take example of COVID. You know, COVID hit. For many young people, that was really like that they consider uh, significant, you know, like it's, it's, it changes uh, the way how they perceive the world uh, in, a, in a moment where they want to be outside, exploring, traveling, 
they experienced that they were trapped inside, uh, they can't move easily, they cannot have interaction easily with other people physically as well. And it was a moment for them of reflection to understand that this kind of events will recur more in the future and it's their future. So what are they going to do about it? So they are worried and uh, concerned. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that they will, and they're also they are willing to organize themselves. They have the energy uh, to do that. They understand the, their responsibility in that. Hopefully we're trying to. And of course, the role of design there is very important. I asked them uh, once to uh, imagine a future scenario. They need to design a guide. You give them the opportunity to investigate the present and how the present is going to affect the future and what can they do about that. So I think they are very, they're, they're ready for this challenge. And I think also it's starting to understand that they need to change as well. I'm not sure about how this uh, influences color but i was just about to ask you like when they design when they make the when they make the survival guides like so you've seen some survival guides right so these survival guides that you just said that these students made what are prominent colors that they use if they use color maybe they don't use color it depends on the subject so for example i had uh, i had a student that she she was convinced that the future of humanity like, human, like humans, they will need to leave Earth one day and uh, travel to Mars. And then uh, she imagined the, the landscape. You know, she needs to draw like humans living or living in Mars and what kind of challenges. And then uh, also like imagine that Earth become a place that it's very difficult for us to inhabit anymore. And of course, you, color is very important because you see uh, the Earth becoming more... Uh, yellow and uh, Mars is a kind of, uh, you know, becoming more green. They, they use color to communicate a few things. Mm -hmm. They do uh, also use bright color as a kind of an alarming uh, uh, colors. They want things to be clear, like bright yellow, bright red, or really bright pink. So uh, yes, for them, the idea of survival was linked to a lot of bright, yeah. strong color. Like action colors, like alert, like yeah. emergency. Yeah. Yes. And a lot of contracts as well. Like, yeah, most of the scenarios were also like dark. I was also surprised. And we had also this conversation about the power of imagination that maybe we also need to change that, start to imagine good scenarios. Otherwise, they will not happen. And also, yeah, that, that also changed the way how they perceive uh, the future as well that like we need to we need to find a way out somehow and we will find a way out like if you look back in history we always did without compromises and we need to acknowledge what that yeah. so it was a kind of way also to uh, make them think that they have a role to change the future and they have a role to uh, educate the public about the future and about what's going to happen using their skills to speculate and to provide solutions yeah. uh, that maybe at this moment are not feasible for many reasons, but there are ways uh, and we need to invest more in them. Well, talking about color symbolism, because, you know, they use dark because they don't see a bright future. They use very bright colors to wake up people like, hey, this is the last call. You guys need to wake up. But when you look at yourself and obviously the journey that you have made, born in Syria, lived in the Netherlands, now you live in Egypt, you've traveled the whole world. I mean, you've ha you've exhibited also over the whole world. How would you think color symbolism is so different, especially from where you grew up and then where you mainly have have been have been working which also of course you started in the Netherlands what are those main color symbolisms that are really according to you um interesting to 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 talk about in uh, to the audience i'm i'm not sure if i in my work like if in my design work i'm really colorful like uh, when i design it, it's become a style as well but with uh, my installations i think 
color is more subtle. Sometimes also in some projects, there is a lack of color because the lack, like I mean, lack of color. So color is a bit almost, do not, we have an installation, me and Lauren, we, we did for Pli de Rome. It was almost gray. There is no like significant color. And I think sometimes lack of color is just like for me a moment of uh, trying to create this space where you don't identify with it and, and you don't identify with symbols. Color, color can be distracting as well. It distracts. So when something is red, blue or yellow, green, yes, you are attracted yes. by the color, but it's, perhaps not the texture or the material. Exactly. I think now there is more, for sure, more interest in material and texture more than color per se. But for example, in a city uh, like Cairo, I always um, advise my students to use color, bright color, because you really need to stand out in yeah. all these kind of hectic environments. So color can be a way to, you know, get an attention, you know, like or, or trying to 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 grab an attention. Yeah. But also it can be the opposite. Like I remember me and Lauren once we worked on a project in the Netherlands during the election time. So we were commissioned to work to to produce a campaign about equality in the Netherlands. And then when it comes to color, we were really it was really, really difficult to to pick a color. And in the end we decided you know, like with the environment full of election posters, screaming of color, and also uh, the the meaning of each color that it's connected to right wings or the leftist parties and all of this. So we decided that the campaign is going to be black and white because that was the only solution to stand out. So, of course, black is a color too, white is a color, but I mean, they were neutral. The neutral choice at that moment compared to what's really happening around it. So I think when it comes to choosing color, you need to be very strategic. You need to also to consider the environment, where this work will stand, and how you are going to see it, who is going to see it. And also, I think in my work in particular, I like not to be direct and I like to puzzle the audience sometimes i like the, some uh, to add some surprises like uh, to trick the audience because this is sometimes the only way to and and stop you know because we need to also acknowledge that people now see a lot they consume so so it's not about creating something appealing beautiful moving whatever it's just about something that break their rhythm and uh, make them like stand for a moment and think about it. How to use that? Color for sure is one of them. One of the those strategies. Yeah, I think color has a very powerful way to communicate um, or sometimes not to communicate, just like what you did with the black and white when you were indeed um, doing a campaign in, in the Netherlands during election time, which is always a crazy time because everybody is asking for attention. It is, it's interesting how, how color can, can work that way, but also the deeper meaning of color and the meaning it has in different countries. That's obviously, I think that's the most interesting thing, that one color has a different meaning in one country and in one region th than the other. Um, I think, think that is the, the biggest learning point when you are a designer. You need to be aware of certain cultural colors as well, political colors, cultural colors, religious colors. And I think that is especially a, a study on its own when it comes to, to color when you are designing for a global world, of course. Yes. And I think also it's a matter of taste as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, sometimes when, when you understand the reason about specific, you know, how, how the material you're using, for example, if, if we are, for example, when we talk about textile and dyeing textile and sustainable way to dye textile, of course, the colors are not going to remain bright all the time because it's the technology used are not advanced yet to, to fix the color. Remain bright. But we believe it's better for the environment, so we need to adapt to it. So maybe in the future, like fading colors, they'll become more popular. You know what I mean? I think it's... 
way how you perceive things, um, you will be, we will be wearing maybe more white because uh, dyeing would be like, dyeing colors would be too expensive or too harmful. We are going to play a role in that, like how we promote those kind of things and uh, those kind of practices and also uh, embrace them instead of uh, reject them because we, our belief that we, or we believe that uh, now it's more trendy to have brighter color. So I think we, we have a role in that to prepare the public and to prepare communities to, to adapt to that. I fully agree. I think natural pigments of colors are coming back. And obviously when you work with natural pigments, it means that the color will change over time because it doesn't fix the same way to a fiber than a synthetic uh, pigment, of course, does. Um, it will take a while before the world is completely ready. I think some markets already are, but obviously it's a complete change uh, in the game of color. It's, it's, it's a game changer and like everything in this uh, in this world, everything takes time. What is next for you, Ralia? What is like a project you're working on, or maybe there's a future dream project that you'd like to work on? Oh, this is a very nice question. Well, I have a lot of uh, I have a lot of ideas. Like a year ago, I started this uh, collaboration where archives um, that exist here in Cairo. So one of them is the archive of the American University where I work in an attempt to reuse design to reread and reinterpret uh, those collections. Also to uh, discover new information also related to design and creative practices in the region and through history. I would like so much to continue that because I think here in, in the region, there is a lot to uh, to investigate and to research. Mm-hmm. So this is this is one project like I started and I'm busy with, and I think I would I would be busy with like in the coming ten years. Yeah, uh, also a big project, very big project. I, I I see potential of design in that direction to as a way to produce knowledge mm-hmm. uh, about the creative tree and about the creative practices in the region in a very appealing and interesting way. Maybe it's not defined, but I, I mean, it's not big enough. We started it uh, and the results until now are very nice uh, because I also use my classes and I involve students in that. So yeah, this is, this is where I'm busy. And, uh, and I, maybe I would like also to share with you some of the uh, research that students did about color history, because mm-hmm. they they published uh, magazines about that. So maybe also it's nice to, yeah, to share them with you and maybe also with the audience because there are some nice stories. So we maybe I can make a collection and we we can like share it. Yes, the more color, I mean, color people generally are very insatiable like they always want more more and more color information so i think anything that is worth sharing on on color and color stories especially from different viewpoints i think that really feeds to our imagination and of course to everybody's work and everybody's design of understanding more what is needed in the world of design yes totally agree Talia, this has been a great, great way to, to talk to you. It's um, my mind is like bumbling, like it's already thinking about next steps. And especially now that you you shared that you want to share some some color work of your students. Thank you so much for sharing your work and your your viewpoints and being part of the Color Authority podcast. Thank you. Thank you Edith, for hosting me. As you said, like I think there is a lot to discover about color, color understanding here in the region. We need to change this stereotype that Cairo is a very dull and uh, yeah. colorless uh, city. There is a lot to discover. But I hope uh, I, I delivered like some interesting uh, insights for the yes. artists. You sure did. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed this last episode. If you are a fan of the Color Authority podcast, please let us know by reviewing and rating our show on whichever platform you're listening on. The next episode is coming out next month. And in the meantime, I'm wishing you a wonderful, colorful day.